So now I wanted to take a little bit of time to demonstrate these new features and functions in our updated AirMet View version 9.9. .9. So switching over to AirMet View, I'm going to open up some sample projects that I have created here. The first is going to be an example um, for the continental U.S. that uses the 2016 data from um, NLCD. So I've already got a project built here. I've loaded in my surface and upper air data. This project happens to be located in Reno Tahoe area. And if I go to my sectors and select the sectors surface tab, I can go to the air surface utility within AirMet view. So here's the air surface utility. You see it defaults to the regulatory approved 2060 version. For users who have existing product projects in AirMet view, um, it will default to 13016 since that was the version available at that time. Um, but you can, of course, make the easy switch yourself over to uh, 2060. So uh, the first feature I want to show off is a new feature where you can automatically select your station location within this preview window of the air surface utility. The tool that I'm highlighted over right now looks like a little anemometer vein. Um, as you select that, you can zoom in on the map and click anywhere to more accurately place uh, the station location coordinates. Right now it's using the default values that were gathered from the surface data file, but if I were to zoom in tightly on my surface roughness radius, I can see that that's located in the middle of a road, which is not going to be where my anemometer is located. I happen to know that for this particular location, as I scroll further north into the runway, I can select my station locator tool and my anemometer is going to be located approximately in the center here of these two runways. And now it automatically sets these coordinates for me based on my selection. So that's one way we've tried to make this a little bit easier to use. Then I can come in and go to my WebGIS tool and I select my 2016 USGS NLCD data. It goes out to our WebLake servers where we have custom created individual tiles of each of these products. The data files that are available directly from the entity that makes the NLCD products, their name is MRLC, the Multi-Resolution Land Cover Consortium Group, they have one large tile and it's extremely large far too big to download into anybody's application directly. So we've gone through, converted their data into the proper GeoTIFF format, and we've made custom sized tiles that are much smaller and much easier for everyone to download and load into the application. And you can see that automatically brought in the land cover, the canopy, and the impervious data for this site. I would then go through and make the appropriate changes to the period, surface moisture, selecting if this is an arid region, defining my month to season relationships for each of the months that I'm processing, come in here and identify this as an airport location. When I do that, it identifies all sectors as an airport, but the 2060 version of AirSurface allows you to change that. If any particular sector is not considered airport land cover, you could make that determination here, and I'll do that in a second with a different example. And then I have my output files, so I'm ready to run my case. It processes the data. It ran successfully. And another new feature in AirMet View version 9.0 is that it automatically displays the land use viewer utility so I can see what my digital land cover looks like for this region as soon as my run is done and finished successfully. I close that and then return to AirMet and then I'm ready to run AirMet with my values that have now been imported for each of the 12 sectors that I defined. As another example, I wanted to show how valuable that this station locator utility can be. I'm going to switch over to Google Earth here for a second. And I have zoomed in on Google Earth on the uh, west side of the Big Island of Hawaii. And I can see here a little flag showing me the approximate location of my meteorological station at the Kona International Airport on the Big Island of Hawaii. But as I zoom in, I can see that there is, in fact, no MET station actually where these coordinates note. It's up here to the northeast. 
And if I use my ruler utility within Google Earth, I can actually map this out and see that the distance between where the documentation tells me the station is and where my station is actually located, it's a couple hundred meters off. And when you're dealing with a surface roughness radius that defaults to one kilometer, you want to make sure that you've selected that station location as accurately as possible. So back in AirMet view, I'm going to close out my first project and I'm going to open up a sample project that I've built in Hawaii. I've set my latitude and longitude coordinates already to the approximate location that I is given in the metadata for the Kona International Airport station. I switch to my sectors. I go to the air surface utility. And in the air surface utility, I can automatically import my lakes satellite tile map imagery. And then when I do that, nice high resolution imagery comes in. I zoom into my surface roughness radius. I can even use my zoom tool to zoom in a bit closer here. And I can see here is where my station is currently located, but this up here is the equipment that I'm interested in. This is what that ASOS station looks like. The anemometer is going to be located here. It's that little tower sticking up. So I use my station locator utility, click it in, and now I've placed my station location automatically. Very easy to do. Now for Hawaii, something that's a little bit different about Hawaii is they only have land cover for 2001. The 06, the 11, the 16 data products, if I try to load those in, it's going to tell me, oh, there's no data found for that modeling area. So I can try the other ver uh, products, like 2001, and it's going to import that data for me. There is also canopy data for 2001 for Hawaii, but the impervious data set is not um, from the same product year. So at this point, it's not recommended for use, so we've only loaded that land cover data set for this particular location. I can also come through here, set my climate parameters. I'll use an annual period since uh, it's pretty much always spring or summer in Hawaii. Not a lot of variability there, so I can make those changes. And then in my surface roughness tab, here's where I can show um, the ability to differentiate sectors as airport or non-airport. Because as I look at this region, you can see I've got 12 sectors of 30 degrees arc, and we now highlight the selected sector. Notice that as I scroll through my uh, table of sectors, we now highlight which one you've got. So you can highlight each sector and say, does that look like it's got airport land use? Well, in this case, I'm going to say no. I've got several sectors here on the western side of my anemometer that I would say do not classify as airport. They do not have runway or low-lying uh, impervious surfaces associated with a runway um, or an airport on that side of the MET station. So I can leave these sectors, which encompass the runway and other airport-related uh, developed land cover classifications. And now Air Surface will allow me to refine its calculations in that way. So again, I run Air Surface. When it is successfully over, it shows me the land use viewer utility with that. And it shows me what the um, associated data looks like. Now I can see from the land use viewer, there is an area of undefined land use here. Out far, far to the west, the edge of the ocean is not classified. To improve my calculations, I could come in to the Tools menu and under the Land Use Creator Utility, open up my land use creator, automatically import my existing 2001 land use, and then where I have this missing undefined area, I can say unassigned. Select what is unassigned, and now I know this is going to be all ocean, so I can set my code to open water, apply, and then I can save out this file, just give it a new name, I'll say Hawaii Kona 2001. Save this file. Go back into Air Surface. Open up the file that I just created. So this is now a 2001 NLCD TIFF file here. And now when I run with this particular file, 
I get a successful run, but if I dig into some of the deeper output from that run, I'm now going to see none of that missing area out to the west where there's open ocean. And I can go through my different output files and see the summary and the logs. They're no longer going to warn me about missing data. And then one more example that I wanted to show, for those of you who are not located in the United States, this particular example actually uses both surface and on-site data. When you have separate surface and on-site station data to input to air surface, you have to run air surface twice. You have to run it for each station. So I have air surface for my surface station, I have air surface for my on-site station. And since this is a location in Canada, I'm not going to be able to use WebGIS directly. Instead, I can go to the Tools menu, go to my Land Use Creator Utility, and build myself the uh, GeoTIFF file that I'm going to need to run AirSurface. And in this case, I can do that by importing shapefile data. So under the Import menu, looking for a land use file here, I have an existing shapefile that encompasses this domain. I select that shape file and it presents to me the dialog where I can then classify or, or translate the classifications from the shape file into the classification used by NLCD. So I'm going to select here the geographic or latitude longitude projection for my file. Define that. Then I select the attribute that contains my land use data. In that case, uh, in this case, the files attribute is the cov type for land cover type. You can then go through and make the individual selections of going attribute by attribute and defining which of the NLCD categories it aligns to. You can also predefine your own CSV file that has these determinations made for you, which is what I've gone and done here. So I import a simple CSV file that translates my shapefiles attributes into a land use code for NLCD. The process then reads the file to make sure that it aligns with the modeling area that I've defined here. And since this is a pretty small domain, AirSurface only works on a 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer area. It doesn't take too long to import that data from my shapefile into the utility. I only need a couple minutes of time to do that. Once it's finished, I still have the full capabilities of the land use creator at my disposal. I can go through and define areas that maybe the shapefile hasn't fully updated, um, such as developed areas, or maybe if I'm working um, in an area with a mine or a landfill or some type of land use that is constantly changing, I can come in here, predefine that area, select it with my polygon selection utility, and then make the appropriate changes by defining new land use codes um, for that particular selected area. There we go. A great looking file there. I would just assign this a name on site, NLCD 16, save it out. And then just as I showed with the Hawaii example, come in here, open the file that I just created. And I would go through and make the usual changes to air, my air surface setup and run the model. For this particular project, since it did consist of both surface and on site, as I said, you'd have to run it both. You'd have to do it for both the surface station file that I had already prepared and for your on-site station.